These days, we should probably be calling Boy George Man George because he's been around for so long. In fact, it's more than 30 years since he began wooing and wowing his adoring fans. In that time, his singing and performing career has soared to dizzying heights with number one hits and millions and millions of record sales. Boy George has also had some stumbles along the way, but hey, what pop star hasn't made headlines for all the wrong reasons? Now he's getting the old band Culture Club back together for a world tour that's kicking off in one of his favourite countries, Australia. So what is the difference between Boy George and uh, George O'Dowd? Not much. <laughs> a hat. <laughs> to my brows, <laughs> basically. <laughs> At 54, George O'Dowd still looks remarkably like the 80s superstar he was. The iconic, the unique Boy George. He took flamboyance and unabashed sexuality to new heights and achieved success that, at the time, seemed as outrageous as his looks. I didn't think beyond the week. You know, I just thought, I'm gonna start this band and Maybe we'll make a record. Maybe we'll get on top of the pops. For just four incredible years, Boy George and his band Culture Club dominated the airwaves and became one of the greatest pop phenomenons of all time. We didn't know what the future held. We didn't know that people were going to like us. We didn't think, I mean, I certainly didn't think I'd be sitting here in 30 years time talking to <laughs> interviewers about my career. George was one of six kids in the working class O'Dowd family, very Irish and very Catholic. You said that you were the pink sheep of the family. You know, my dad would never let my mum dress up, so I did, I did the dressing up. I kind of took on that role of, of being the sort of attention seeker, the exhibitionist. I remember one of my most vivid memories of, of childhood was um, my Auntie Josie. She sent up a box of clothes to my mum. And they weren't things that my mum would even ever think of wearing, but I was straight in this box. <laughs> and there was this kind of long Lurex silver cat suit that I kind of picked out and sort of got, <laughs> got it on. Got to the front door and I heard my dad say, get that off, you know. Young George always felt a misfit. His increasingly colourful style drew unwanted attention, especially at school. Were you expelled from school? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, after months of trying. Um, because I knew that um, the only way to get out of school was to be thrown out. So I went out of my way to, to get myself thrown out of school, and it was, it was a very happy day when they threw me out. I was delighted. So did you know what you wanted to do? Not up until about 19, you know, everybody seemed to be doing stuff. And I was kind of the last man standing. I was like, mm, what am I going to do? And I did notice at the time that a lot of people were starting bands. So it really was literally, oh, well, everyone else is starting a band. I'll start a band. Do you really want to hurt me? Do you really want to make me cry? Do you really want to hurt me? What Followed was Culture Club and sales of over 150 million records, beginning with a hit he never saw coming. Do You Really Want to Hurt Me, I think you said it really just changed your life. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want that out. I, I went into Virgin Records and said, you can't put this one out. <clears throat> no one's going to like it. It's really slow. You can't dance to it. It's really, it's too personal. It's slow and boring and you're going to ruin our careers before it's... <laughs> even started and they looked at me like yes you're an idiot go away <laughs> and we we're the record company and we can put it out and it came out and then it, it just spread like wildfire Do you really want to I remember that very very clearly that uh, you know it was like well this is actually we're part of something huge really it wasn't just the music that caught public attention Boy George's appearance was equally beguiling, except in America, 
where fans had no idea what the band looked like because their first single was released without a cover photo. The first time people really saw us was uh, a gig we did in Long Island for a radio station that was supporting us. And I remember when we walked out on stage, people were gasping. They were like, because oh, it was so, you know, for them it was so incongruous to what we sounded like. Because they'd only heard you, they hadn't seen you. Absolutely. And again, once people saw us, they just liked us. <laughs> What's not to like? If their first hit was a song George hadn't wanted to release, their second, Karma Chameleon, was one his band didn't like. I wrote it when I was in Egypt um, on holiday, and uh, when I sang it to the band, they kind of laughed at me and they just said, oh, this is awful, you know, it's a country song. And I had to kind of fight to get it on the record. I had to kind of, I think I might have even had to threaten to leave the band. I was like, this is going on the record. Because I knew it was a hit. That my love was an addiction. When we came, our love is strong. At George's home, he can't wait to tease the band about their first reaction to Karma Chameleon, dismissing it as a country and western song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently none of you liked the song no, when you first true. heard it. I, it wasn't my favourite melody that George ever wrote, but I liked it. I, lyrically, I think it's great. But if we could write another one like that tomorrow, oh, we'd definitely do it. <laughs> Culture Club still no, is Roy really Hay. Yeah. So we're kind of in each other's lives. Mikey the Craig. The songs, they still feel great. They, they still they feel fresh. That's the thing. And John good. Moss. The band's like, it's like a prodigal son that keeps coming back, which is nice, but it's almost also like a nightmarish child. <laughs> which keeps turning up as well. So it's a sort of mixture between the two. That they're actually sitting together at George's London house is nothing short of miraculous, given Culture Club crashed and burned when George did as a drug addict. There's so many people that you end up kind of really hurting, and, uh, you know, for me it was, uh, yeah, it was a disaster, and um, I'm so happy that I'm who I am now. How did you get out of it? It's a gradual process, you know, you have to kind of change your mindset. That's really where it starts. You know, there are some people in the world who can have a drink and you can't. put the glass down. There are some people in the world who can have one sandwich, <laughs> <laughs> one biscuit. <laughs> I'm an addict. I can't do one of anything. <laughs> I just, I think at this point in my life, I know that that's the one thing I was really bad at. You know, I function best when I'm sober, clear-headed, as healthy as I can be. That's when I'm at my most vibrant, you know, most fun. And the other thing, you know, just it was just a disaster. I mean, everybody knows what a disaster it was. The fans waited patiently as George O'Dowd pleaded guilty to possession of heroin. Boy George arrived at the Manhattan court this morning facing charges. Found guilty last month of falsely imprisoning male escort Alden Carlson. Did fame add to all of that? I don't know. There are people who are famous and don't do those things, you know, and I admire them. So, you know, you're, you become famous at 20 years old. People pretty much let you get away with everything. Nobody really stands up to you. And, um, you know, so you do develop a sort of full sense of your own self-importance, you know, how powerful you are and, you know, but I think if you're smart, you, you get it and you go, actually, this is not a great way to live. You know, I'm very lucky. And I tell myself that on a regular basis. Imagine there's no heaven. George has been sober for eight years, rebuilding not only his life, but also his career. There've been books, a fashion label, and a successful career as an international DJ. And now a new generation has discovered him in the UK as the favourite judge of The Voice. It's a little bit of an 80s vibe going on in the look. Yes. <laughs> so there's really only one place for you to go, honey child. <laughs> I've had 
The last few months uh, in the UK, I've been on The Voice. It's been incredible to um, kind of reassociate with the British public, you know, um, you know, and people have been very nice. And I've just been myself, you know, it's not like I've done anything that I wouldn't normally do. No, but it's nice know. for them to be reminded, oh, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, when I went on The Voice, I think, oh, am I going to be interesting enough? I'm just going to be me. And I was thinking, oh, God, is that enough? But Trust me, that's that enough. You may say I'm a He's riding a new wave of popularity, swamping critics who said he was washed up. But it's just this weird... So the thing of our times that if you get to a certain age, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of deemed uncreative or... or it, the, the cool word in England is, oh, you're not relevant. Oh. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the buzzword, oh, it's so not relevant. I'm like, I'll decide whether I'm relevant or not. <laughs> and I think there's, you know, there's, that, that's why that sort of um, having a renaissance is always great, you know, for the naysayers, because you can say, oh, I'll let you know when I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, George and the band are far from finished. In fact, they're just starting again with a world tour that kicks off in Australia. Well, you're coming to Australia and the... I know, it's so you're, exciting. You're, um, are you? Yeah, I love Australia. I like Australia because, you know, it was very good to us in the beginning. It was one of the places where we got the most kind of love, really. And there was a lot of love during that first tour to Australia in 1984. More than 10,000 followers flocked to the Rundle Mall when word spread that Culture Club were there. It was like, wow, you know, what a reception. And I got given the keys to Tasmania, which I still have. I don't know what that means. Are they big or... Is there just big. the one key? <laughs> yeah, one key, that's like... <clears throat> you know, I always feel like Australians are like the British anyway, aren't they, a little bit? They're kind of straight talking, you know, they say what they think. You know, I've had some quite tricky interviews in Australia. <laughs> some of my you? most memorable, <laughs> some of my most memorable moments have been with like, oh my god, did you just ask me that? Remember with Norman Gunston? Have you ever sold anyone a shonky used car? No. Eh? Oh. oh, and uh, you're a poster. No. <laughs> oh. You definitely are. Oh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> no. It was a shocking question then and one that would not be asked today. And Boy George helped bring about that change. In the last few years, I've really learned to kind of respect what I did. Because on top of all of the record sales, one of the things that was really significant about Culture Club was that we kind of changed the way people thought about things. You know, we shifted people's attitudes in terms of, you know, sexuality, a little bit in terms of race, you know, uh, in, in terms of individuality, and I'm really proud of that. So, if you like that music, right, you're still going to like it now. The rise and fall and return of Boy George hasn't been easy. Beneath the makeup lies a vulnerability and an appreciation that people still care about him. Yeah, it's a, it's a very nice feeling. It's a very nice feeling to feel that kind of warmth and affection from people that you don't know. It's amazing. It is a weird thing, but it's a lovely thing, huh? It's a weird thing, but it's a lovely thing. That sounds like a great <laughs> sum of me. <laughs> <laughs> this is Boy George. <laughs> yeah, he's a weird thing, but he's a lovely thing. <laughs>